Oh, well, good morning to everybody. Hello. Oh my goodness. It's so nice to see everybody as it always is. Am I coming through okay? Is my volume all right? Is it? Okay. Thank you. I asked the, the crew, our sound crew, to give me the Pastor Clark treatment. Like, dude, boost it. Just go all the way, man. I normally talk kind of low, so I'm like, well, let's make sure that we, you know, boost it up a little bit. And speaking of which, thank you, Pastor Clark. Um, my sermon got a nice filter. I don't know if you guys ever take a picture. You're like, man, I look pretty good. But then you apply the filter. Like, okay, I look better now, right? So I had this earlier in the week. Uh, your notes are pretty succinct, very, you know, bite-sized. And yeah, fitting in line with my, with me, I suppose. But, you know, I edited it a little bit. And thank you so much to Pastor Clark um, for making some good suggestions. But the, the actual... Stuff in there is the core, but I'm gonna, it's, it's better now when I actually speak it out. So, <laughs> And, you know, again, this is a church that really wants you to grow, and it starts at the top. So even with his busy schedule, thank you, Pastor Clark, for assisting me. I do appreciate that. Yes. And so if you're here, expect for people to want you to grow. Amen? Okay. So let's go ahead and pray. So, Lord, we thank you for this day, Lord God, another day that you've given us, Lord God to know you, to serve you, Lord God, to love you, to be loved by you. Lord, help us to come with open hearts, Lord, to allow the Holy Spirit to make the corrections in our life that, that he needs to make, that he needs to point out to us. And Lord, give us the grace to make those changes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so the title of my message is Slam, and then with the, sub, the subheader of Leave No Open Doors for the Demonic. Yes, amen. And, and so, if we can, really quick, I want, us, I want us to use our imagination. So if you can, of course, no, one, no one's going to force you to do this, but just close your eyes, right? So I'll close mine. Now, imagine your stereotypical American house, four bedroom, two bath, in the city. It's nine o'clock. There's a husband and a wife, two kids. They go to bed. And the front door is wide open. Now, take just a few seconds to think what might happen with that door being wide open. Okay, now let's change the scene. Now let's take the same house, but let's put it, let's just say, in the countryside. Same thing, door wide open. Okay, open your eyes now. And thank you for participating. I feel like that was a little bit uh, children's church. Okay, class. So, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, as much as we love to think that there's no crime and there's no issues in this world, a lot of times if you leave a door open at your house, unfortunately, someone's probably going to want to take advantage, come in, steal stuff, wreck stuff. And if you live in the countryside, you might get some animals. You might get a coyote, a bear, depending on where you live, a raccoon. Nothing fun, right? No one's going to come in and, oh, you know what? This door's open. Let me give them a gift. Here's $100. That's not going to happen, right? And you might say, well, maybe I'll close the door, but I just won't lock it, right? That's the stereotype of some people in the Midwest, we have some family in Kansas, I want to say, uh, many, many years ago. It was kind of like that, not anymore. But, you know, you could close it, no one would worry about anything. But you're still leaving yourself vulnerable because that door is unlocked. Right? And then some people take it to the next level. They got alarm systems. They have personal private security, depending on how wealthy they are. But at least for the average person, the least you could do is make sure all your doors are closed. The windows are closed as well. Everything is locked. The garage is closed. Some people forget that at night you drive by their house. Oh, dude. The garage is wide open. Look at all that stuff in there, right? That does happen. I remember when we used to live at an apartment complex, some people would leave their garages open. I'm thinking, like, dude, with the way that the structure is, like, no one's, if you want to take something, you could easily do it, right? So we need to make sure everything is under lock and key. And that's the same thing applies to our lives, right? Because if we leave an open door, how many of you know the devil will steal, kill, and destroy, right? So we need to make sure that we don't, oh, I'm going to gently just close the door, close the window, whatever. I did the opposite right there. But, you know, we need to make sure we slam all the doors shut, leave no room. And I want to look at our foundation scripture. First, I'm going to look at it in New King James, Hebrews 12.1. Uh, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, I'm going to read it again, but this time through the Amplified Classic. Therefore, then, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us, and let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us. Now, all of us have our own unique purpose, right? We all have our own race to run. And the last thing we need to do, assuming you want to actually finish that race, right, fulfill your purpose, is to be weighed down by anything. And a lot of times that can be sin, right? So if we leave some open doors, mainly through sin, but through something else too, which I'm going to talk about, then the devil will right away take that hook in and just drag you, ragdoll you, and make sure that you do not finish your race. Or even if you do, you're completely mangled by the time you're done, which is not how God you know, wants it to be for us. And so when it comes to leaving doors open, there's two things that can keep doors open to the devil. One of them, which we're not going to spend as much time on, is just being spiritually unproductive with our time. It's so easy to do something like a hobby, whatever, something that you like to do for leisure, whether that's working on your car, for me, maybe playing video games, watching sports, and the time just flies by. You know, I think about, just to put myself out there, you know, I, I like to watch uh, MMA fights, as many of you know, and a UFC event, a stereotypical one, which most of the time they're on Saturdays, will start like at 2 o'clock, and then the pay-per-view is at 7, and then that doesn't end until like 9. So that's like 7 hours of just not doing anything spiritually productive. Although normally I will at least pray in tongues. I'll do something like that. Be like, okay, Lord, as I'm watching someone get beaten up, you know. But for me, that's a lot of fun. Not, not necessarily watching the person get beat up, but the competition, the martial arts, all of that. And, you know, it's fine to have work, right? We need to work. We need to make money. It's fine to take care of our kids, take care of our spouse, go on date nights. But we can't make our life completely focus on all of those things. And uh, a brother of uh, mine who I met when I was doing MIP, he was doing camps, and he actually recently became a senior pastor at a church, uh, a church of God in the NorCal area. And the church was super small, but it's starting to grow, thank God for that. And he's like, okay, I'm going to need to do some new members classes. And so he did, and he had someone with him that he was going to do it with. And as uh, my friend, his name is Patrick, we're, we're actually going to get on a call just to talk, catch up, see how things are going. And he actually got a call from that person and so, you know, he, he talked to him for a while. They did their thing. And then when he was done, you know, he reached back, out, reached back out to me. And I was like, hey, is everything good? He's like, yeah. But then he told me what happened. And what actually had happened was the person called him to kind of, like, cancel. They're like, hey, I'm sorry, but, you know, you know, my uncle just kind of bought me these tickets for Disneyland. They're really good. You know, it, it was a really nice package. And they felt kind of guilty. And my friend was like, no, it's fine, dude. Don't worry about it. Like, if you want to do it, do it. But don't let there always be something that comes up. Because right? some people, there's always something that comes up to push God out, whether that's for prayer time, for worship, for fasting, for going to church, etc. And I was watching this one guy on YouTube, and it was he said something that really struck with me. He's like, hey, some of us, like, if you treated your boss the way you treat God, you would be fired. Because so many of us don't want to make any time for God, right? But for, but for things like work, Oh, hey, overtime, I'm there. Hey, I need to do this, I'm there. No problem, extra project, it's fine. No, no big deal. But with God, oh, sorry, I got to do this, I got to do that. And then something else he said was that, it's like if you ask people, hey, do you want a nicer house? Yeah. Hey, do you want a nicer car? Yeah. Hey, do you want more money? Yeah. Do you want more of God? Oh, I'm good. Right? That's a lot of people's attitude because it requires, it requires a lot. Right? A relationship with someone when you actually care about it and want it to grow requires work, right? It's like two people who, who like each other, they're not, they're not just going to fall into a marriage. They're going to have, well, I mean, with the way some people get married out there with some of these TV shows, maybe they do fall into it. But generally, if you expect it to be long lasting, it takes real work, right? And so being spiritually unproductive with our time is one way to leave the door open, right? Because when you do that and you make your life about all these other things, you could lose that first love. And so the second thing that can leave a door open is sin, right? And when we sin, we open the door for, for the demonic to come in to influence us in some way. Like not straight up possession, right? We have the Holy Spirit, but to be under the influence of the demonic in some form. And I think about 1 Peter 5 eight: be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? He's looking for those open doors. Now, not everything is the devil's fault. I mean, sometimes we're just stupid. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I, I say that because you think about the zoo. If you stay behind the glass, the fences, the barriers, 
and you see a line, you're good, right? But then there's people that jump inside and then they get mauled to death and you're like, well, whose fault is that, dude, you know? Some of you might be familiar with this documentary or movie, I forgot what it was called. I do not recommend it from what I'm about to say, which is that it's a, it's a, like, again, like a documentary film about this guy who was like all about bears and he thought that he was like kind of with them, connected with them. You know what I'm talking about, some of you. And then at the end, the dude gets eaten by a bear. It's one of the most horrific things ever. You don't see it. You don't see it because the, cam the lens was on the camera. But you can hear the screams. And then they found the DNA of him and his girlfriend in the excrement of the bears later on. And so it actually happened. This wasn't like the Blair Witch Project. Oh, it's all set up. Like this was a real thing that happened, right? He placed himself in that position. So sometimes it's not even the devil. It's us putting ourselves in that position, just leaving the door wide open. Right? If someone comes to your house and they break it open, that's a little bit different. Right? But we need to make sure we're doing our part. Right? All right, so what are some of the dangers of leaving the doors open? Well, one of them, of course, is we're not going to fulfill our, our destiny. We're not going to finish that race that we have set before us. And one of the people I think about is King Saul, right? the, the first king of Israel. Man, what a responsibility that must have been. I'm the first king of Israel. These are God's people. It's a huge responsibility. And for a while, he was doing well. But then he got into sin. He got into disobedience. He had an unlawful sacrifice that Samuel was supposed to offer because he was the priest, but then he offered it instead. And then there was also a war they were involved in where he was supposed to kill the king, all the people, the livestock, but then he kept the king alive instead and saved the good livestock for himself. So again, disobedience. And then we, so he gets rejected by God, 1 Samuel 15. But then by the next chapter, 1 Samuel 16, we see that the spirit of the Lord departs. And then what happens, he gets a distressing spirit, right? So he opened that door for that. And we do this ourselves as well. And, and this comes to a second thing uh, in terms of the dangers of leaving doors open is that we can live a life of bondage. Again, even if you might fulfill your race, you might still be under that bondage, whatever that might be, addiction, lust, gambling, anxiety, fear, depression, you name it. And that's not how the Lord wants us to live, right? I love that beginning song, who the sun sets free is free indeed. He came to set us free. So why put ourselves in that position to be under bondage, even though we're saved? And so now, okay, well, what are some things we can do to ensure that we don't have any open doors? The first one is strive to live holy. Now, in, in, the, in the actual notes, I have it just don't sin, but that's a little bit impractical, obviously. Oh, just don't sin. You're fine. He'll be fine, right? That's a little bit too easy, <laughs> but we should strive to live holy, right? And if we want to do that, we need to be productive spiritually then with our time. So what would those things be? Well, they would be the things uh, that you might imagine, right? Like the first one, staying filled with the Word of God, which, again, you need to sacrifice to make that time to really sit down and read it, or at the very least, make sure you're getting time to listen to it. If, you, if you're maybe you're more audio, you can listen to it on your phone, through your car radio, or CD. I think of Psalm 199.11, which says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then, of course, we see this kind of example with Jesus, Right? In the wilderness, after he gets baptized, the Holy Spirit leads him. He fasts for four days, four nights, and gets tempted by the devil. And every time he gets tempted, he answers with the word. Right? And I'll give one of those examples, Matthew 4, verses 3 and 4. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus, so he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every, mouth, by every uh, word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so a modern example of this, because you can apply this to your life now, is let's say you have an evil boss, right? We hear about these evil bosses in corporate America. They're trying to get you fired. They don't like you, but they, you know, you, you're not going to quit, but they don't want you there. So they'll, they'll do stuff so that way hopefully you do end up quitting or, they can, or you can get fired. And rather than, you know, speaking curses against them or trying to be an enemy to them in some way, you could be looking at Luke 6, 28, which says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. In Romans 12, 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, right? Like, so if you have that, if you're filled with that, and rather than trying to get them fired in retaliation or whatever, or having some sort of crazy argument with them, you're going to be in your prayer room praying for them, right? Praying for them to repent, praying for them that they would know God if, if they don't, all right? Praying blessing for them, which is hard. It's not easy. I think we all know that's kind of difficult. It's a lot easier to say, Lord, you know, yeah, just get rid of them. I don't care how you do it. Just get rid of them, right? But again, if we're filled with the word, then that's not what we're going to do. We're going to actually pray blessing on them. And so a second thing we can do to strive to live holy is to pray in tongues. And 
I love what Romans 5, 16 says. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the way to walk in the spirit, one of those ways is to pray in tongues. I think about Jude and it says, but you beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 18 with the apostle Paul, he says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. And we know the kind of ministry he had, right? Absolutely amazing. Wrote so many of the books of the New Testament and he's someone who's praying in tongues. So do we, do we want to do what he didn't have that same impact? I would think yes, right? Yeah. And so also going to church, right? That's another one that for so many people is so hard, especially now, because things are available digitally, which is still great, but then it becomes an excuse. And you could see this going all the way back to when, you know, services were put on TV. Oh, I just watched this minister on TV. And they just, and, and that's good. There's some teaching there, but you still need to be connected to a body. You need to be connected to other believers, and I love what it says in Hebrews 10, 24, 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. So if you're not connected, then it's going to be really hard to be exhorted, to be encouraged, to want to keep going, especially when things are down. And, you know, you think about the stereotypical, like, American sitcom or movie when there's a breakup. One of the first things that happen is the person that has the breakup, like, their friends come, hey, Let's go out. Let's go do something, right? They just want to encourage them. They want to keep them moving. The same thing can happen, of course, at, at our, here, at any church. We are going through something very difficult. It's great to have those brothers and sisters to come alongside you, to just be with you. Don't have to say anything. Just be with you. And, of course, be praying for you outside of that. But then also this gives us some accountability. You know, I think about those people who love to do uh, workout groups. So they work out, but they always make sure that they're around, like, several other people, and then they keep each other accountable to make sure, hey, did you, did you run this morning? Did you lift those weights? Right. What is your diet like? Did you cheat this week? And it helps. It really does versus trying to do it by yourself. Now, some people are super good about being by themselves about that kind of stuff. I wouldn't be. So, you know, I would definitely need that accountability. And the same thing goes for things spiritually. We need that accountability for really trying to grow, for trying to finish our race. Amen? All right. And then also fasting. Now, we talked about fasting a lot in the beginning of the year, so I'm not going to go, you know, heavy into it. But, you know, fasting is such a great way to kill the desires of our flesh, to connect with God, to see what his heart is, right? As we set that time aside to really seek him and put aside whether it's food, you know, whatever things we love, social media, so on and so forth. And you'll hear things you, you could never hear before because you were so distracted with those other things. So if that's something that is very important. I would highly recommend adding that to your spiritual life if that's not something you're, you know, that you do. Again, does not necessarily have to be food, but something that you love. For Karna, it would be food, as we found out earlier, because that's her love language, of course. And so, nextly, uh, in terms of things we can do to make sure we don't have any open doors, aside from striving to live holy, we have sincerely, this is important, sincerely repenting of your sin, and then there's a slash there, potentially casting demons out because you might have a demon it's somebody anybody not just not pointing at anybody in particular of course but you know when you leave that door open it's possible for that demon to come into now all of a sudden be influencing you right and we see examples of this in the word uh where is it i'm gonna get to it a little bit later actually but you can probably guess who they are because we teach the word here amen so these things have come up before so maybe you already know it but in terms of, again, leaving the open doors, I want to look at Proverbs 26, too. Like the sparrow in her wandering, like the swallow in her flying, so the curse without a cause does not come in a light. It doesn't just go on the undeserving, right? You, and that door has to be open. And some people think, okay, well, I haven't done anything super crazy, right? The average Christian would think that I haven't killed anybody. I haven't gone to a bank to rob, you know, the bank. I haven't cheated on my spouse, so I should be good. But it's also in the small things that you would never think you know, that that could be an open door for you. And so I want to read another scripture, Song of Solomon 2, uh, 15. Uh, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes, right? Those little things. It could be as simple as being a part of a conversation where there's gossip. It could be something where maybe you were driving and you flip somebody off. Things like that. I'm not going to say if I have or have not done those things, you know. But I am aware that they are sometimes part of the human experience. Is that fair to say? No. Yeah. And so, it, and by the way, it's also possible that, this, that the sin, these open doors, it might not be just because of us. 
it's possible that there might be something generational there and that kind of sin that, that maybe you did, it might not take a hold of you, but somebody else down the line. And I remember watching uh, a testimony of a pastor who talked about this woman who came to him one time and brought her son and her son. And I shared this once before, many years ago. Her son had a very strong spirit of lust. He was only like five or six, and he was already touching women inappropriately. Again, he, he, this kid hadn't done anything. It just was there. And they were trying, and she was so broken. She's like, why is this happening? Come to find out, it's because she had this life of promiscuity right before, and then she had him out of wedlock, and then she turned to Jesus, but she had never actually like, repented of that lifestyle. So once, once that was repented of, then they were able to cast that demon out of the, the son who had the lust, and he was good ever since. So a lot of times we think, oh, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting away with it, right? Because we might not see the effect on us, but it could, we could see it later on other generations, and I feel so, you know, you feel so horrible for these kids like this from this example, as well as the ones who grow up thinking with the gender issues, right? Oh, I'm actually the other gender or they have homosexual thoughts. And it has nothing to do with them. and It's not even their fault. So, but as Christians, we're, when it comes to sin, sometimes we don't want to confront it. It's to, but again, this comes with being accountable and being a part of a local church body to kind of point it out with the people that you're close with, at least. Maybe not someone you don't have a relationship with, but someone that you're close with. So they can point that out to show you, hey, Maybe we should double check the music or double check the film or so on and so forth, the lifestyle. Of course, in, in the right way, as you're led by the Spirit. And uh, some people would think that Christians cannot be demonically influ- influenced, whatever word you want to use, not possessed, but oppressed, demonized, whatever. But we see examples of this in the Word again, uh, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. Uh, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised from the third day. Then Peter, right, Peter, who obviously believes in Jesus, right, one of the inner three, Peter, James, and John, right, they're always with Jesus, took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Right, Peter being influenced in some way to say something that was against God's will from the demonic. We see this also, of course, as many of us know, with Judas, uh, Luke 22, 1 through 4. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot. And again, we know Judas believed in Jesus, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And then, of course, we also see this type of thing even after Jesus, because someone might try to argue, well, that was before, Right. But then, you know, everything happened. Now we have the Holy Spirit, so on and so forth. But then we see this in Acts chapter 5 with Ananias, who had sold some property along with his wife, and then lied about how much they actually got back because they wanted to hold that for themselves instead of giving it to the ministry. And then Peter asked him, and he said, you know, why has Satan filled your heart to lie? Right? Man. And, of course, he died along with his wife. They were both just struck dead. So... It is possible, and believe it or not, this actually, something like this happened to me, believe it or not, this week, and I, I didn't know that was going to happen. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit that connected this message to what was going to happen to me earlier this week, but on Friday, I was at work, and I made a comment to one of my coworkers who I'm really cool with that, hey, one of our other coworkers look, looks like the lead singer from this one metal band, and you know, which he does. It's really funny, and he's like, oh, I didn't know you were into that, and I'm like, yeah, I, I am, but like more so in the past, not really now. And so I was like, oh, okay, for sure. I'll send you something. That, that right there, I should have been like, okay, probably not. But I'm like, okay, man, whatever. My plan was to just, he's going to do his thing. I'll listen to it really quick. I'll just say, listen to it, and I'll be on my way. And so as I was working, he sent it. And the, the, the band, I could see the thumbnail. I knew right away. I'm like, okay, I know this band. I know they're very much not, uh, not godly. But I'm like, whatever, I'll, I'll play a little bit. And so I... I, right when I hit play, I could feel this demonic just darkness and this heaviness like right here. And I'm like, ooh. Yeah, so after like maybe 30 seconds, I cut it off. And it didn't leave though. That darkness was still there. And I'm trying to work. I'm like, dude, this is not good, right? And so right away, I got with the Holy Spirit. I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, what is this? Right, because I'm like, okay, this has to be something, something demonic. There was some door here, which was my fault. Like, I have to own that. I should have just been like, oh, okay, thanks, man. I never listened to it, right? But I asked him what it was, and right away I heard spirit of defiance. I heard it right away, and I said, okay, so let's let's just go for it. And so what I did was, I'm like, okay, God, I repent for listening to that song. I should not have listened to it. I opened that door. 
please forgive me, please cleanse me from that. And now after I did that, now that it's repented of, I said, okay, spirit of I cast you out in the name of Jesus. You must leave now. And I, I'm not kidding. I was hearing, not in the natural, but I was hearing screaming in my head or in the spirit, whatever you want to call it, because the demon did not want to go. I mean, it was loud, demonic screaming. And after about maybe 15, 20 seconds of me just telling it needs to leave, eventually it went and the screaming stopped. And as soon as the screaming stopped, I felt the presence of God so strong, this peace, this lightness. I was like, oh, it's gone. I was like, okay, thank you, God. So I learned my lesson, obviously, you know, but <laughs> glory to God. Yeah. And this was something small. It was just, hey, just listen to the song real quick. That was it. It's, this, was, this wasn't me going to a, some sort of concert by this band, right? It was something small. And I, and I think about this. Uh, some of you might know about Don Dickerman has a great deliverance ministry. He gave an example one time about this one pastor who he was doing deliverance on, and he, he had a spirit of lust, and, and he asked the spirit, you know, how long have you been here as he was doing the deliverance? And he told him how long or whatever. And so they got through deliverance, the demon leaves, and then the pastor goes and tells Don, he's like, oh, I know when it, when it came in. And so he tells him what happened was when he was a kid, him and his friends were playing down by like this wash area, and there was a Playboy magazine there. And he already knew, hey, we shouldn't be messing with it, but they still looked at it. He's like, we wouldn't touch it. But we used a, a stick. He said, we used the stick and we would turn the pages, right? Because they knew, like, I should, I should not be looking at this stuff. But they still did. And the spirit of lust was in him since then. And he was already, this, just, this pastor was already, I think, 50s, 60s, and finally got delivered from that. Right? So, again, we, we open the doors and then we, we don't have to. But we don't have to live with those things, right? Even though the doors are open and we're being influenced. And I thank God that he wants to set us free. Amen? So, it does, you do not have to live with these things. And... So again, but sincere repentance is the key. Um, you have some people that are very well-meaning, and they'll take a verse like Luke 10, 19, which says, Behold, I gave you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and the things shot by enemy has hurt you. And then to, to want to do, you know, spiritual warfare with that, but without looking at the people, right? Because Jesus gives the authority for the people, he sent, he sent us to go to people to cast demons out of them. He's not like, hey, go against the spirits of North, you know, North Korea countries and stuff like that. It was to people. And a lot of times we can be very cavalier, kind of like a cop. You think about a cop sometimes who, although they've been sworn in, they have a badge, they have a gun, they have authority. Imagine them going rogue and doing their own form of justice. But no, there's a protocol, right? And it's the same thing spiritually with us, even though we have the Holy Spirit and we have authority. And it's one thing to be spirit-filled. It's another thing to be spirit-led, right? We have people who are spirit-filled, but, then, but they're not being led by the spirit. They're just kind of working out of the flesh. And we know from John 6, 63, the flesh profits nothing. Psalm 127, 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, right? They labor in vain who build it. Unless he guards the city, those who stand watch guard in vain. And then I think about, you know, John uh, 15, 9 with Jesus, who's the ultimate example of being in complete, absolute alignment with God. Uh, then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. Right? He, he's on the same page. Right? So we need to be on the same page. We need to be checking with the Holy Spirit before we do something. Right? And I think about another example that Don Dickman gave where there was a woman that came to him who had some sort of spirit. I forgot what it was. And it wouldn't leave, and he got to talking to her. And, you know, and what, come to find out, she was going, and she was a Christian, Right, filled with the Spirit, baptized, all that stuff with the, with the Holy Spirit. And she was going with some other people to go around a strip club to bind the spirits over the strip club. But see, the problem is she's not praying for the, they were not praying for the people, right? So they were stepping out of their authority. They're going straight to those demons to say, oh, no, I bind you this and that. But no, when again, we're called for people, to minister to people and to cast demons out of people. And so a result that happened was severe backlash for her because that had happened. He told her not to do it. She did it anyways. And about six weeks later, she came back and her husband all of a sudden got addicted to pornography. And she said, it's completely ruined our family. Right. And that is, that was legal to happen because she stepped out of her authority. So again, we need to be led by the spirit. We need to be casting demons out of people, right? Not going against uh, demons, you know, in the second heaven, so on and so forth. Those principalities, right? Because if you could do that, then you, the whole world could be fixed. Like, oh, I'm going to fix Afghanistan then at that point, right? I'm going to go into every asylum, and just make sure everyone is good, you know, but we can't do that, right? You need to make sure there's sincere repentance in place. So you pray for the people, pray for their heart, pray that they would turn to God. Amen. And man, what time is it? 
I feel like I just flew right by. It's eleven ten. Okay, that's not that bad. Okay. I was I was like, man, is it gonna be like ten fifty right now? Kind of just flew by there. Um so I'm getting ready to close past work, you know, I guess. Did you want me to hand you the mic after I'm done or? No, I meant like after. Okay. <laughs> okay, because it's coming up. <laughs> But just to really conclude and bring everything together, again, we all have our race to run, right? We don't want to be slowed down. We don't want to be weighed down. We don't want to have any open doors which will invite demonic influence into our lives and that which will definitely slow us down. And we want to be productive spiritually, right? Which we do through things we already know we should do. But the question is, are we doing them, right? Are we going to church, right? Are we reading our Bibles? Are we fasting? Are we praying in tongues, right? And of course, you can throw in other things in there like worshiping, are we giving, so on and so forth. And, you know, if we do those things, we place ourselves in a lot better of a position to be successful, right? Not, again, not everything is the devil's fault. Yes, he's running around doing his thing, but us, you know, making it easier for him to leave these open doors is not helping. So let's make sure that we're accountable to one another. We're trying to grow. We're trying to implement what we, you know, see here when we, when we read the word of God, when we hear teachings. And make sure those doors are closed, not just gently but that they're slammed shut and they, they're lo- you log it, make sure you never go back there. Amen? All right, so God bless you guys. Thank you. Put your hands together one more time. You know, I want to ask the worship team to come up, but this is a very important message. Oftentimes we exclude ourselves when we hear, you know, messages that are like this, but what open doors do you have that you need to close? I want you to bow your heads right now, and we really want to take the opportunity to, to listen to the Holy Spirit as he has spoken through Pastor John today, open doors will destroy you if you don't take the opportunity and hear the voice of the Spirit calling you to close those doors. Doors of anger, depression, unforgiveness, pornography, sexual sins, doors of hatred and pain, anger and revenge. I want you to right now think about a door that you need to close. And as you do that, I want you to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to help you Close those doors. The devil just needs a foothold before he can bring the whole house down. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this timely message. Doors that need to be slammed, closed, shut. Doors of we've left open. Doors of vulnerability that we have it's been open to for centuries, for, for years in our families. Doors of divorce, doors of alcoholism and drug addiction, doors of imprisonment and unemployment, doors that need to be closed. If you don't close those doors, it will be open for your children and their children's children. I think that this is a very sacred moment right now. And I want to pray for those of you who says, Pastor, there's a door that I need to close. You just need to know what it is. And if you have a door that you need to be closed in your life, it could be doors of anger, 
on forgiveness. This is a fantastic moment. Because by the time you leave here today, the door that was open is going to be closed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And someone, I, I think it would be remiss of me if I left that opportunity. If you are here and you are sincere, you say there's a door I need to close. Forget about everybody else. I want you to come to the altar right now. I want to just give you that opportunity to stand up, come forward. We want to pray for you. Doors that need to be closed. Doors that need to be closed. Hallelujah. 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 Doors that need to be closed. Lord, I need to close this door. It's killing me. It's destroying me. sin is sin. There's no gradation. There's no hierarchy. We all have areas that we need to be closed. I think there's a few more of us that have doors open. Don't leave here with the door open when there's an opportunity to close that door. Don't leave here open as you came in. Hallelujah. Jesus. All of you are at the altar, I want you to look at me right now. And I want you to pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are merciful and that you died for my sins. This open door has caused me many sorrows and many sins and I sincerely repent and I receive your forgiveness. I do not have to be perplexed by guilt no more. I receive your forgiveness for all the things that I've done wrong. And I realized that you died on the cross so I can be free. And I receive your freedom right now in Jesus' name. And today, I close the door by the power of the Holy Spirit and it will no longer affect my life I walk away from the door that door is locked that door is sealed that door cannot be opened angels are on either side of the door protecting me and I walk into new life into freedom into wholeness into forgiveness into joy hallelujah come on let's give him praise right now give him praise right now
Pastor John for such an Thank awesome, yeah. powerful yeah. message. Lord, help us to close the doors that we have left open so we can receive your purpose and we can walk into our destinies. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you this morning. Before you go, now those of you who may not know, but every Thursday we meet here at 7 o'clock. And I'm telling you, you are missing out on something. Because it's a time for just bathing and receiving. There's some things that we can't do here. But on a Thursday, and if you have not been before, I'm, if you have not been on a Thursday before, raise your hands. Just raise your hands. You haven't been, you're honest. Okay, good. Um, I want you to try to come along this Thursday. And um, we just have a time of just bathing and worshiping, and a time for when we're talking about closing doors, we just need more time to minister, to work things through spiritually to cause deliverance to take place that happens on the overflow service on a Thursday. You don't want to miss it. God bless you. Don't rush away today, but meet a, meet a new friend. Who knows? Maybe your best friend could be here. Your spouse could be here. Who knows? Amen. But just grab some coffee, Amen. make a friend, have some fellowship before you go. Amen. Father, we thank you today. We pray that you will dismiss us with your choicest blessings. In the name of Jesus, we say amen. God bless you.